Hello. Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, luncheon on the second day of Entrepreneurial Imperative 2012. I'm Grady Vanderhoofen, and it's my uh, privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the luncheon today. Uh, and uh, so please go ahead and enjoy your meal, and we're going to get Eric up here in just a minute. Eric Donsky is the managing partner of Laguna Ventures, a technology incubator commercializing revolutionary materials that have applications across a broad range of industries. Prior to forming Laguna Ventures, he was the founding CEO of Tier Lab Corporation, an in vitro diagnostics company commercializing novel lab on a chip technologies that provide air eye care practitioners with the capability to quantitatively measure biomarkers in tiers at the point of care. During his tenure, the company raised $30 million in a series of private and public offerings, developed a first-in-class product from the lab to commercial launch in 15 countries, concluded two multi-center clinical studies, built a chip manufacturing process from the ground up, and obtained a 510K clearance from FDA to market the product in the United States. Tier Lab received the 2009 Medical Device Excellence Award for its achievement in the design and engineering of its proprietary Tier Lab system. Donsky was also the founding CEO of Applied Carbochemicals, an industrial biotechnology company that pioneered the production of chemicals and polymers from renewable resources. Its joint venture with a French agribusiness company has facilitated the construction of a succinic acid manufacturing facility. The company is venture-backed by Safanova Ventures and corporate-backed by Samsung, Toyota, and Mitsui. Mr. Donsky graduated from Boston University in 1987 with a BS in business administration. So that's the, the stuff about Eric Donsky that you can read in the program. Uh, but I've known Eric for about 17 years. And uh, so I thought I might make a couple of comments about my, my personal interaction and my knowledge of Eric over the last 17 years. I originally met Eric in, uh, I think it was late 95. He mentioned something yesterday about 94. At the time, he lived in Southern California, and he was building what would be applied carbochemicals. And uh, we worked together. I was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And Eric and I worked together on what was the first multi-laboratory cooperative research and development agreement and the first ever multi-laboratory license agreement in the Department of Energy involved Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, NREL, PNL, Argonne, and Applied Carbochemicals. And at the time, that had not been done before. I remember Eric was in Southern California, and, and partway through the process, he moved to New York and, and I thought, gosh, why are you moving to New York? And he moved to New York because that's where he was going to raise money. And I remember he was working with an attorney who was taking equity instead of cash uh, because that was the way Eric could pay the guy at the time. And we worked on a second CRADA together in 98, 99 time frame. In the time that I've known Eric, he's been involved with at least uh, six technology-based startup companies. He's licensed technology, intellectual property from multiple universities, multiple national laboratories. In the time that I've known him, he's raised tens of millions of dollars, literally tens of millions of dollars, maybe as much as a hundred million dollars. And uh, all from angels, interestingly, and strategic partners, none from venture capitalists. That's really his only shortcoming, is he hasn't raised money from venture capital. But he'll have some comments about that in a minute. Uh, he's exited multiple companies. He sold companies to financial investors, to strategic investors, taken companies public. He's lived in California and New York and spent time in Brazil. He's had a phenomenal knack of uh, basically doing whatever it took to be successful. I would describe Eric as passionate, tireless, tenacious, and smart. He's very, very smart. He's smart on a technical level. He's an interesting guy because not everybody has the ability to converse with technologists and investors. He is smart in terms of his technology sense and his willingness and ability to dig deeply into a technical issue and understand it. And he's also very smart with respect to his business sense. And it isn't every entrepreneur that can speak eye to eye with the scientist and walk out of the room and speak eye to eye with an investor. And Eric has the ability to do that. 
I can say, you know, honestly, that working with Eric in the mid-90s was one of the experiences that calibrated me, truly, honestly, helped me understand sort of what it took for an entrepreneur to be successful in technology commercialization. It was a, it was a tremendous experience for me. And so I think this is going to be one of the highlights of the conference, frankly. Uh, Eric is going to be speaking on the anatomy of the startup. And please join me in welcoming Eric Donsky. That was awesome. Thank you. Well, I don't know how to follow that up. Um, I should probably say, Grady, just keep going. It's, this is great for my ego. Well, um, I'm not here for my ego. I'm here for you guys because what this is about is for us to find what it takes to build successful businesses. And I know in East Tennessee, like most other places in the world, it's about economic development. If you think about the history of the United States, we've been innovators. We've been, invented our way to great economic success. And I hope we continue to see that educating kids to become engineers and scientists is an imperative that we need to pursue aggressively. You know, if I were to have the money to start a charity or a foundation, it would be about educating kids about science and engineering because we don't want to lose our capability to other countries uh, that are seeing that as a priority for their youth. So before I get into my spiel about the anatomy of the startup and how I, you know, have uh, succeeded and learned from some of my, let's just say, my challenges uh, in a humble way, uh, I want to thank Sean and his team at Tech 2020. They're, uh, they're really tireless in trying to educate the startup entrepreneur and the would-be entrepreneurs about what it takes. And I think that's an important initiative uh, to bring everybody together to have a conversation. What is it all about, Alfie? No, I'm just kidding. So I think it's really important for us to understand what it takes. And I'm here to just provide you my points of view on uh, startup. And of course, Grady, thank you very much for your friendship. Um, Grady's been a great, great companion, and you know I love his points of view. And I think if, if anyone is interested in raising venture capital in East Tennessee, they should go to this guy because you know what, I have a fairly adverse opinion about VCs, and I'm probably going to be kind today because uh, Grady said he'd kick the crap out of me if I if I wasn't. But I would say that Grady does really understand what it takes to partner with entrepreneurs, and I think that's really important. So let's proceed. So. What I, what I uh, wanted to say about myself, and I think Grady said a lot, is um, you know, I've built several, s several companies, and through sheer will and determination and working with great people, uh, I've realized some good success. And you know, everyone likes to hear, you know, is this guy credible? So I'll just throw this out there. I've built companies that today have a cumulative market cap of about $2 billion and growing. So you know, I've had some success, and what I really enjoy is working with great people, because it's not about me, it's about the vision, and it's about the people, because it's, it's, it's a company is based on the people that work every day tirelessly to make an idea into a great business. So I really think uh, being a coach and getting out of the way and letting people flourish is really important in building a team. And my passion, as Grady talked about applied carbon chemicals, which today has become bioamber, is my passion is about sustainability. Because our country really needs to think about how to become more sustainable and wean off of its dependence on, on crude oil. Um, I, that's just that's my passion, and whatever it is that drives you emotionally, you've got to connect with that when you start your business. Because if you're not passionate about your business, you're going to have a really hard time succeeding. Because passion is the key ingredient to your success. Because not every day is going to be easy. So when you feel that passion, you're going to be able to overcome those challenges day to day to get over what you need to get over to move to the next challenge, the next milestone. My, uh, to quote my father, he told me this once, he goes, without passion, you could be good at your profession, you'll never be great. So what I want to you know, convey to you uh, philosophically is that connect with what drives you because starting a business is not just about making money. It shouldn't be, in my opinion. It should be about learning expressing yourself, being creative, and working with great teams, and making an impact. So let's talk about the difference between revolutionary and evolutionary. So in my opinion, um, while I really love revolutionary technologies, it may not be for everybody. So I think your first big decision when starting a company 
is connecting with the differences between a revolutionary business and an evolutionary business, and I think that's your first big decision. Because with a revolutionary business, it could take well over a decade to realize successful penetration into a market or successful commercialization of your products or your services or materials, whatever it may be. So in, from my experience, my first company has taken about 20 years uh, to get to where it is today. It's about a billion and a half dollar market cap today, but I'll talk about this in a minute. But when I first started the company, people would find it crazy to think about making chemicals and plastics from renewable sugars versus petroleum. I would go to DuPont and I'd say, hey guys, this is a great idea. You should diversify away from petrochemicals. And they'd say, that sounds crazy. Crude oil is trading in about a $12 to $18 price range. So it seems to me that that would really be a little, a little presumptuous to think that that makes any sense to us. So, uh, you know, they would pat me on the head and send me on my way. And I, you know, I would probably tell this story so many times to ADM and, and BSF that this is really something they should do. And today, uh, they make it a key initiative for their futures is bio-based manufacturing. But it's about the timelines it's going to take to get to, to your first product. So if you're not committed to a long timeline, stick with things that are iterative, faster, better, cheaper, or evolutionary. Also, when you're dealing with things that are revolutionary, in most cases, it's going to cost a lot of money to commercialize that technology and meet your milestones. So I'd really, again, think about your capital formation if you're in East Tennessee and you can't find the right corporate partners early on and you're not going to be able to mobilize the capital that you think you're going to need to execute on your business, you know, think, think smaller, maybe think evolutionary, because evolutionary is, there's no shame in that. If you think about Apple, they're not a revolutionary company because the MP3 player existed before the iPod, the smartphone existed before the iPhone, and the tablet PC existed before the iPad. But what, I, what Apple is great at is they're the masters of evolution. They've made every product better. They've created great user interface, great customer experience, great customer service. So there's nothing wrong with focusing on iteration in existing markets. Also, when you think about, oops, when you think about, uh, that's kind of, those two points are going in tandem, I don't know why, but anyway, when you think about revolutionary, you have to think about the investments you're gonna have to make in building your core competencies. So when I've started companies, every technology I've started always comes with a new manufacturing process that never existed before. So I thought, wow, I'm never going to be able to outsource manufacturing, in most, or probably in most cases I will not be able to because there's no one that has these capabilities to manufacture my product. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to have to build it myself. So what's that investment look like so I could actually build this manufacturing capability and these R&D capabilities in-house? So you have to think, if your model is such that you want to outsource, most cases it's going to be an evolutionary type of a business. Uh, also investment in your IP portfolio, or intellectual property portfolio. Again, if it's revolutionary versus evolutionary, it'll come with a different price tag. Today I'm developing a whole new class of nanomaterials with a great team of people and what we came to realize, there was virtually no patents in the art, so we had to hire in-house patent counsel because we realized that in order to execute on our patent strategy to take advantage of the first mover opportunity in the space and file hundreds of patents, this was going to cost us a bloody fortune. In the first two years in our business, we spent over $2 million on IP prosecution, and we're going to spend $2 million over the next 12 months. So that's $4 million in three years on IP. So again, really connect with the differences in time and money and manpower it's going to take between evolutionary and revolutionary. And again, there's, the, I think, the analysis of risk versus reward. You know, if you think about how much you want to make versus how much risk is inherent in your business and executing that business, I think it's important to think through that. Because not all times revolutionary technology is going to pay the biggest dividend to the startup entrepreneur. Because if you need a lot of money, sorry, Grady, if you go to venture capitalists, you know, most likely you're not going to own much at the end of the day. So it may be better to do something evolutionary where you could raise less and you may have liquidation events more frequently. And there's nothing wrong with that. So at the end of the day, you may make more money doing the things that are faster, better, cheaper. So let's talk about the evolution of the startup. The startup goes through stages of growth. And let's start with what I think is the most imperative and the core of this entire process, which is ideation. And in the cases of licensing IP from institutions like MIT and Ohio State and places like that, UT, um, 
it's tech transfer. So building a partnership with your IP institution is going to be tantamount, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So at the core of this is picking the right idea, uh, building that tech transfer partnership, and building that relationship with your inventors, because that's, that's really very, very important. And then consequently, or subsequently, it's the valley of death, which a lot of people have heard this expression, which is moving your product across this chasm from concept to proof of concept. That's a really perilous place, because that's where you're prototyping and you're validating your value proposition to your prospective customers and partners. If you don't do that well and execute and have the sufficient capital to do that, you're out of business. And most companies don't make it, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the next stage would be commercialization, where you're launching your product, either outsourcing or scaling your own manufacturing, and uh, potentially internalizing R&D and other capabilities. And growth would be diversifying your customer base, maybe launching new products, and expanding your capabilities like manufacturing in other parts of the world. So what we're going to focus on today for the sake of time and the theme of this conference is the first two stages. Ideation and tech transfer is stage one, and value of death is phase two. So why do most startups fail? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and we talked about some, but one of the ones that I believe is is really a big one, is picking the wrong science or the wrong idea. So I think we had a discussion yesterday on the panel that it's about people first and idea second, and I kind of countered with, I'm not really sure if that's exactly right, you know, how that balances, but it's like any other asset class. If you pick the wrong piece of real estate or, and or you overpay for it, you're not going to make money. So the same thing is true here. If you pick the wrong idea, no matter how passionate you are and how well you execute, it really is going to be a difficult progression if, you're, if your whole company is based on something that may not work ever. I'm a big believer that if you have the right science, it's going to translate into a product pretty quickly. What I've seen time and time again is a lot of companies throw good money after bad, thinking that eventually this will work. I, I've never seen that happen. I mean, it really doesn't happen that way. So, from my opinion or my experience, it's, it's going to either happen or it's not. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to think about is execution. Investors pay for execution, management's ability to follow through on the idea and take it to, to market and be successful at raising money and executing on the financial plan. But if, if, if management can't execute, then a great idea goes to waste. So that's something else that is obviously something to consider. Also, not raising enough money. What I've seen countless times also is projections that are maybe a little too aggressive. Uh, we'll talk about that as well soon. But also burn rates that are very excessive, where companies aren't really thinking clearly about what they need to spend and what kind of teams they need to build and what they could possibly outsource that'll keep their burn rates low. Because think of it as your money. Whether you put your own money in or not, this money's precious. It's the most expensive money and the most critical resource you'll have. And the biggest fear I have every day is running out of money. So as at all you entrepreneurs out there, that should be your biggest fear. And you know what? Be afraid. Because that'll make you feel uncomfortable enough to really manage every penny. And that is really important. Also, weak talent pool. We touched on this yesterday in our panel discussion about what happens if there are not enough good people around here to hire. Well, I think policymakers need to think about job training. We, you know, incubation is also real. We talked about incubators and accelerators, where people that have done it before should hopefully see their interest in spurring economic development regionally to, you know, contribute some of their resource and their time to educating wannabe entrepreneurs to think a little bit more intelligently about their businesses, you know, impart their wisdom. And lastly is poor public policies. You know, I'm not putting this all on politicians, but politicians in some states, and we heard yesterday from the gentleman from Ohio State's Tech Transfer Office and Josh from MIT about some of the progressive policies that are coming into place in their Tech Transfer Office, which were really exciting to hear. And policymakers are realizing that the IP institution really needs to be progressive and active about developing investment-grade science. And that's important because we don't want IP institutions just to be repositories for ideas, most of which aren't really commercializable or investment grade. Uh, there we go. So picking the right idea. 
a lot of people go, this technology is so cool, I got to go develop it. Not a good idea. It really isn't, it, it, I, you know, as I said yesterday, it's like I, I've been really excited about science. I'm a scientist by heart. In, you know, the way I, in my soul is I love science so much and believe in it so much, but if you get too euphoric about the idea and not about your business in total with all the fundamentals considered, you can get really lost in the science. So I think your selection criteria has to involve way more than just the science. So what I would typically do when I start a business is I don't just go pick a technology. I don't do that. A lot of people just do that. They come across something cool and they go, I'll find a market for it later. Maybe not the best approach. What I would do, and what I always do, is work backwards from the need. What are customers not getting today that they really need to have? Let's think about mobility, you know, as an example. The mobile market is booming, but what's the biggest constraint? It's battery technology. So there's, a real, there's real pain points for those customers, and they need better battery technology, better technology that enable higher energy storage to give them the power they need to drive the features and benefits of the future. Because you guys as customers want the next great thing. And that market has reached maturity. Because most of these devices are starting to look the same. So it's really the software and all the applications and the graphical interface, but all that stuff needs power. So there's an example of a, of a market that they have some very high pain points. So if you define what those pain points are, it's going to really help you pick the right idea. Also, the time and cost of customer acquisition. You know, I see a lot of financial models that assume, oh, I'm going to penetrate 10% of the market in the first three years. And I scratch my head and I say, wow, what are the, you think your competitors are just going to, you know, lay down and let you take their market? It's probably not realistic. So when you build your models and you think about the numbers and your assumptions are everything. Forget about what the model says because investors say, can you give me a P&L and we're pre-revenue? I say, well, what do you want it to say? I'll make it a billion dollars in five years, a hundred million, what do you, you know, I can make the, you know, the earnings or profits 20%, I'll make it any way you want it to be, but it's, I don't know enough, I don't have the visibility to build something credible. But let's talk about the assumptions. The assumptions have to have credibility. The model could evolve over time. The more you learn, obviously you'll be able to devise better models, but I think the assumptions have to be really well thought through. How much time and how much money is it going to take to get someone to change what they've been doing as far as their routine in consuming a product or service and switch to our product. That's not trivial and, I, and through my experience it's much harder than I thought and I'll give you some case studies on that momentarily with my last company, Tier Lab. So scrub the assumptions. If they don't work, walk away. Just for, don't get emotionally attached. Just move on. Um, I think in our discussion yesterday, both of my counterparts in that panel discussion were saying we want to kill it early. So don't be afraid to kill it. The world is f flooded with ideas. There's no shortage of ideas. It's about picking the right one and executing. I'm going to talk about intellectual property a lot today, so I'm going to sound really redundant when I say IP, IP, IP. But if you're building a technology company, it's all about the IP. Because if you're building plant capital equipment in the ground, that's nice. It's great, especially if you have a proprietary process, but it's a depreciating asset. If you have patents on that technology, great. Those are the assets that are going to matter, especially when you do partnerships and when you sell your business or you take your company public. So what I always do, and I would recommend it, and I know it's kind of expensive, and like Grady said, you know, maybe trade some equity to your lawyers uh, to get the right counsel, because doing patent searches in the very beginning when you're picking your idea is everything. If you find that you really can't find some real estate that you're going to be able to acquire as far as intellectual property, Again, walk away, because you've got to know that you're going to have some assets that could be monetized at some point in time in the future. And then lastly, when picking the idea and commercializing something that comes from a national lab or an academic institution, it's building that relationship with the IP institution and the inventor. Because the inventor is going to be your de facto chief science officer, chief technical officer, until you reach proof of concept. If that individual isn't ready for the arduous journey of startup and commercialization, it's not going to happen. Because you're not going to spend startup capital on building your own lab. You're going to use that lab. They have the team. They invented this technology. There's a lot of knowledge. So tech transfer isn't just about signing a license agreement. We got a license agreement. That's just the beginning. That's just a legal framework for moving technology out of the lab. 
It's the intellectual transfer of technology that's tantamount. So you have to understand what drives the meritocracy. Why does an inventor do what they do? It's usually curiosity and publishing papers because they want to be known by how many papers they publish and how many patents they filed, and that's all good. But you've got to get them to come over to the, your side of the fence, which is the industrial point of view, to say, okay, maybe you can't publish right now because we don't want to tip our hand to competitors, and I need you to work extra hours, and I need you to think industrially about this project because it's about translation and applied development. You've been doing basic research, and that's well and good, but we need to move on. We need to make this work. So just to talk about my first business, which Grady mentioned, it's, it was called Applied Carbochemicals when I started it, and today it's called BioAmber. Um, the, this technology, as Grady mentioned, was licensed out of four government labs. The DOE had put roughly $20 million in the background intellectual property. We got a $9 million cooperative research and development agreement to further fund this, and this was in 95. That's why we were talking 94, because it took us like nine months to do that license. We got to the yeah, it wasn't, of course not. It's, it's, it, yeah, of course not. It's the lawyers. Blame the lawyers. So anyway, so this business was pretty innovative in that what I had vision, as I said from the outset, about what my passion is about sustainability, I was trying to figure out how can we wean off of this heroin addiction of crude oil? It just seems so crazy to think that we've got to fight all these wars to protect our oil supply and we've got all this stuff. Everybody knows this story. So I thought, what can I do about it? How can I make an impact? So the DOE, these, these, there was five national laboratories that had a program called the Alternative Feedstocks Program. So what that represented was a, a shift away from petroleum as the primary feedstock for our industrial base to an alternative feedstock of renewable carbon in the form of cheap sugar. I mean, this country has so much sugar. I mean, from corn, glucose is in the trillions of pounds. I mean, we can cultivate cheap sugar all day long, which is unfortunately changing economically as middle classes all around the world uh, demanding staple like sugar. But back then, I could buy glucose across the fence from ADM for six cents a pound. And so I thought, let's build a technology that can convert sugar into chemicals and plastics. So then I had to think, how am I going to do that? So I, saw, I found some technology within this consortium called the Alternative Feedstocks and these different government labs which converted glucose and sucrose, cheap sugar, six carbon sugars, into succinic acid using genetically engineered bacteria. So genetic engineering back in 1994 was primarily used to make biopharmaceuticals. To be able to build a 500,000 gallon vat, fermentation vat, and have bacteria growing there and producing succinic acid was like, seemed like a near impossibility. But this was a business that I, I pursued with all my passion, and uh, as Grady says, I am pretty tired. I don't drink caffeine because I would be like running all around the stage. But effectively, we went after this business, and what I came to realize is while the vision was big, timing was early. I mean, we were about, in retrospect, now that I see the evolution of this industry, we were the very first startup in the world doing this. 13 years later, it's finally getting traction. The, the stakeholders, not only the chemical companies, they have committed a lot of their future to this kind of manufacturing, but it was also the consumer. I mean, back in 94, I mean, you guys weren't recycling. I know I wasn't. Today, I compost, recycle, do all that stuff. I'm from California now. I'm from native of New York City, but I've come to realize that we've got to recycle and compost and do all that stuff. It's responsible. But back then, people weren't thinking green. It wasn't something that people were going to adopt because it was too early. So when you build your business, the take-home message here is timing is everything. So if, you, if, you, if your plan is in three years we're going to get to market, you want to hope that the market is going to converge, the need is going to converge when you launch your product. Because as I experienced, I, was, I had great vision, but it, it, it doesn't really, it's not worth much if you're too ahead of the curve. So that, that's the takeaway there. So another, another illustration where customer adoption, adoption may be more challenging than you anticipate when you start your business I want to talk about my, one of my startups called Tier Lab, which is now a very successful publicly traded company. Uh, I would buy the stock. T-E-A-R is the ticker, by the way, but I didn't say that. I don't have any inside information, so no one asks me these kind of questions later on. Hopefully the SEC isn't going to get this video. But anyways, uh, long and short is Tier Lab is another revolutionary technology. When I started the company, 
I thought, eye doctors don't have the ability to measure biomarkers and tears. Every other doctor takes your blood and your other serum samples, like your urine samples, and they test for proteins, chemistries, and genes, which we call biomarkers. And they look for how that may diagnose a disease or which drug to put you on and how you're responding to therapy post-prescription. So every doctor had this capability, but eye doctors never had this. So I thought, oh man, this is a, this is a no-brainer. This makes so much strategic sense that I, like, we have to do this. We're on, a, we're on a mission. So we developed this technology, and what this basically looks like, uh, just to give you an overview of it, is that little chip that's in, held by blue gloves is a, the, a nanofluidic laboratory and a chip product. And if you see the very tip of that chip, I don't know if I have one of those. Do I have one of those things? No, I don't. So at the very tip, there's a tiny little hair-like channel that has a hydrophilic interface to the, the tears in the eye, so it's got capillary action. And that's a lot of material science and electrochemistry on that chip. And effectively, we built this chip to be a tear collection interface to the eye along with that handheld instrument. So underneath that ridge-looking tip is the chip. So that tip will just collect fluid from the eye without touching the ocular surface. And in less than a second, it will collect 50 nanoliters of tear film, which is basically volume that's equivalent in size to the period at the end of a sentence to give you some scale perspective. Very tiny fluid. And we were able to engineer a system that can collect these tears using basically office text. The doctor didn't even have to participate in the front end of the, of the work, patient workup do, using the tear lab. And we were able to get a system precision or coefficient variability of less than 2% for this entire system. Now, if you think about a blood glucose sensor, it collects microliters of blood. There's no shortage of blood when you do a finger stick. And the precision of those is about a 5% CV. So what we built is an engineering marvel. And we got a clear wave, which this is unheard of, to get a clear waiver for a laboratory on a chip product that's quantitative. Usually, you know, um, lateral flow strip technology is pretty typical of a clear wave type product. But this is pretty pioneering. And we got reimbursement in all 50 states, blah, blah, blah. It's wonderful. We get it. So Eric, what does all this mean? Well, it means that while I thought I had something every doctor would want, because now they had a biomarker platform that they never had before, eye care practitioners, that is, in their office that could basically give quantitative measurement of disease that they could then diagnose differentially and prescribe drugs, you'd think, no-brainer, right? Wrong. So our assumptions about adoption and customer acquisition were completely off base. So that's what this basically tells me. So we had to take a step back as a team and think, how are we going to integrate the tier lab into existing clinical routine? Because as I said before, when you're introducing a new product, you're disrupting routine. I don't know about you guys, but most people don't like to change. We have this kind of like, ugh, kind of really adverse reaction, like an allergic reaction to the idea of changing behavior. It seems like a lot of work and a lot of stress. So that's what you're asking your customer to do. So you need to really understand the pain point. So we need to figure out how this device is going to integrate into the way people do things today in their eye care clinic. So we also realized that one of the other customers that we were kind of overlooking was the technician doing the tests. We were just thinking eye care practitioner, you know, the optometrist, the ophthalmologist, the refractive cataract surgeon. We weren't thinking about the techs. So we had to market completely differently to the tech and position the product differently because they were the ones that actually had to do the workup. So were they going to do it? We don't know, so we had to make sure they really loved our product. So what we did was we had a whole bunch of techs continue to come in clinical practice settings that we created, and we observed their interaction with our product. So we learned a couple things. We understand what they liked and disliked, and we understand how to maybe re-engineer the product a little bit to comply with some of the things that they were concerned with. So we, through these kind of studies, we were able to moderate or modify our product a bit to make it more approachable, more user-friendly. You know, so we approached it like Apple would. We wanted to make sure we had the best user experience for the technicians as well as the doctors. Then it was convincing drug companies that this would be a great companion device diagnostic to their therapeutic. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in diagnostics or therapeutics, but drug companies are terrified of diagnostics. Why is that? It would seem so counterintuitive, right? Unfortunately, what they see is, you may objectify my drug doesn't work all that well. That kind of scares me. Also, you may be subsetting or stratifying my patient population 
and, limit, and limiting my addressable market. So this was a concern because we thought, wow, you know, Lipitor cholesterol. Would there be an $11 billion market for Lipitor if there was no cholesterol test? Absolutely no way. But would there be a market for cholesterol test if there was no drug? No. So they're very symbiotic. So we had to find drug companies that had great treatments for the diseases that we were diagnosing. And Abbott, Abbott had a great treatment for this indication. They saw that their drug actually lowered this quantitative measurement to a normalized range using our, the tier lab test. So we built a co-marketing partnership with Abbott in North America. And it's been very successful. And, and we're building partnerships like this with our drug companies that now see our product becoming standard of care. So again, it's finding really convincing the other stakeholders to get on board. But all this takes so much time. The other thing is, how much clinical data do you need to build confidence in the market? So if you're not in a drug-related market, I know I'm using a diagnostic healthcare-related example, um, but it could be anything. A lot of people want to know is, have you proven it? Do you have the data to sell? Data sells. I don't want to hear your opinion. And I know that kind of seems a little curse, but effectively if, or terse, I guess I should say, but in, in fact, it's only about what the data says and what the customer believes. So how do you build that confidence? You have to do a lot of studies. And you have to do well-designed studies. So we had, to do, we had to do studies with over thousands of patients over time, continuing to publish and get our key opinion leaders to continue to use our product in, in clinical studies and keep publishing and publishing and publishing so people would see third-party objective evidence as to why this would advance science and medicine in this area. So think about what kind of data your customers and prospective partners want to see. So really, we needed to make a significant investment in medical education. One of the first things I did when I started Tier Lab is I raised $4 million from the top eye doctors in the world. Because I realized if these eye doctors weren't going to invest in this company, what am I doing? I'm, I was the first investor. And if these guys aren't going to follow me, then I should probably be running for the hills right now because I'm probably in the wrong business. But it was great. These guys put $4 million bucks in. And they said, Eric, we're going to do one better. Not only are we going to give you this $4 million, but when you need to run clinical trials, we're not going to charge you anything but our hard costs. We're also going to waive a lot of fees. We're also going to um, basically publish what you need us to publish within reason. And it, it served wonderfully well because we ran a study, a pivotal study with 1,000 patients. Alcon spent some of the money on that study. And the doctors, by waiving all these costs, enabled us to do 1,000 patients for $250,000 which is remarkable. That study should have cost millions to do. And that's what got us some of our FDA approvals and some of the, the, the confidence in the marketplace. And we were able to use all this data to educate customers from the podium and through publications. So educating stakeholders is everything. So I know I spent a lot of time on that, but I just want to drill that into you guys, that education of your market and all the stakeholders is so important. And you need to run that in parallel with all the stakeholders at the same time. So when I talk about business model, I'm not really talking about the entire business plan, which we'll get to, but this is a big part of it. This is another key decision that you need to make when you're starting to build your business. What's your model? So do you want to build, own, operate? Do you want to be the guy, the, the, the woman that says, you know, I'm going to build this business, I'm going to build some integration as far as uh, into my supply chain, I'm going to build some real assets, raise a lot of money? That's definitely a decision. Um, but you need to know whether you want to take that kind of that responsibility on. So another one is whether you can internalize manufacturing or you can outsource. Because quality control is going to be a really big issue, which we'll talk about in a little bit more. But thinking about whether you can internalize manufacturing or whether you could outsource manufacturing is also an important decision and initiative to consider. Also consider your position in the supply chain. A lot of entrepreneurs, they start thinking about their plan, and they go, we could do it all. We could do all of this. And then I really think about the time and the money and the cost of doing that and maybe some of the retaliatory effects from the, the competitive landscape or the, the, the competitors in the marketplace. So if you have a great material, for example, and it's, it's a, it could potentially be developed into a new standard and you could protect it with a lot of patents, you may find that there's already commodity converters in the market that have built assets to convert materials like this into finished product. So you may decide, you know, I don't need to be forward integrating into what they do. They already do that well, and they've already built these capabilities. Maybe I can partner with them, which we'll talk about in a moment. So figure out where your best position in the supply chain to the customer. Who's your customer? Also, another source of capital and another business uh, model approach is joint venturing with your competitors. 
So, you know, if, if you're in a business where you think you have IP that may be similar to one of your competitors or that, you know, you want to disrupt the supply chain, but they also have a position in the market, maybe by collaborating and, f and splitting the revenues, you may have a one plus one equals three scenario where you're better suited to leverage their capabilities and them yours than to try to go it alone, which is very much correlative to know your place in the supply chain. Partner with customers. So when I talk about alternatives in startup finance, these are some of the ones we're going to cover. So I'll, when I get to that, I'll try to be um, less redundant than I usually am. Partnering with your customers is actually a great way of raising money, but it's also an imperative that I think, I mean, it's worked for me quite often, is understand what they want sooner than later. And if you deliver something that they really want, we talked about pain points, they may pay you a lot for some sort of market exclusivity. So there's really an opportunity there, and, and we'll get into you know, alternative finance uh, in a little bit, but you know, partnering with your customers may be a good decision. Some of you may just say, you know, I don't want to build a business, I've got a family, I love spending time with my family, this is a cool technology, or better than a cool technology, it's, it's a great technology that I think someone's going to want, but maybe I'm just going to license it out and collect some royalty checks. And that may be a very viable business, but one thing to be concerned with, if you're going to license it out, make sure you have a great licensing agreement. One thing I learned about dealing with lawyers, licensing is an absolute craft and science that corporate lawyers a lot of times can't execute well on. And I work with, within the law firm I work with, they have just licensing attorneys, people that only do licenses. So if you license out your technology looking for royalty checks, make sure you have good diligence clauses in there because you don't want to have to litigate trying to get your technology and then you're, because you're depending on a big company to commercialize your technology for you and they may have another product they have in the pipeline. They just wanted to license this so this wouldn't compete with it. They may have ulterior motives. So very, very mindful if you're going to go this route. And, you know, I could talk a lot about that. I've had some pretty bad experiences. But you know, that's just something to be mindful of. One of the other things a lot of entrepreneurs don't consider when building their, or starting their companies and forming their corporate entity is tax. You know, if you talk to most people that do transactions, tax is one of the most important considerations. So when you're starting your business, you really need to think about tax. And when I say that, I mean, what am I going to start? A corporation, an LC, an LP? What, what, is that, what is the right structure for my business? And a lot of these models will dictate what structure to pick. So in the case of like licensing, why would you want to have a corporation? Because all that cash is just going to get stuck in your corporation. Why not have an LLC? Personally, I love the LLC. Every business I, I've been starting recently is all LLCs because they're passed through entities. They're much more favorable. The only time to incorporate is if you're going public, and that's very hard to do. And you can always convert from an LLC to a C Corp. So an LLC is the most tax efficient way to go, and I'd highly, highly recommend you considering that. So when you're building your plan and you're considering all the things, consider the deal killers, because they'll creep up on you and they'll bite you. And a lot of people just, you know, like, la-di-da-di-da, you know, go down the path of building your business. But you got to consider what could come up and be something that could topple your, your, your dreams. So you really want to be conservative and think about those deal killers. So regulatory issues. You know, people say, oh, yeah, I, don't, I, say, to, I say to a prospective um, portfolio company, like, I, I invest in my money now that I've made a few bucks. I think maybe I should invest in other people and, and see how they can do with my money. And like you guys probably consider doing the same thing. And I say, what's the regulatory issues? And they go, I'm not sure. And I say, wow, you haven't considered that. Because I know as someone that's worked in healthcare, and I told you about Tier Lab, that's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. I don't know if, has anyone ever dealt with the FDA? Have you had good experiences? Yeah, I don't know anyone that has. It's one of those autocratic agencies within the government that does whatever they feel like doing. And they could send you a form letter and say, sorry, we're not approving your product. Have a nice life. I've experienced that. And then have a nice life, what does that mean? I just invested five, ten million dollars in this product and all these clinical trials and you told me that if I did X, Y, and Z you would give me an approval. And they said, sorry. So what do you do? So healthcare is very difficult in that you have to navigate the Food and Drug Administration. So consider whatever regulatory guidance or regulatory pitfalls that may be in front of you, consider them very carefully because they could be deal killers. Also, weak IP positions. I talked about IP. I'm going to talk about more about IP. I'm going to talk about more about IP because that's a critical asset of your business. So make sure from the beginning when we talk about picking the right idea, make sure that you build really good intellectual property positions because if they're weak, 
when you go to do a transaction with a sophisticated investor or a potential partner or customer and you have weak IP, that's, that's going to be a big setback for you and it may put you out of business. Fluctuation in raw material costs. If you're manufacturing a product, you need to really consider the raw material cost issues and the trends in those markets for those raw materials. So I'm going to go back to my bioamber slash applied carbochemicals day. As I said, I could buy, when I started in the bio-based chemical manufacturing industry, we could buy glucose for six cents a pound across the fence from ADM or Cargill. Today, it's 16 to 20 cents a pound to buy that same glucose syrup for fermentation. Wowza. So if you're developing a bio-based process, especially something as commodity as a drop in fuel replacement, and your raw material costs just tripled on you, that could be a significant problem. So when I started BioAmber, I thought, we're going to do specialty chemicals. We're going to start with the highest value products first in order to mitigate some of the risks with scaling up a revolutionary technology and potential rise in raw material costs. So be really plugged in with your raw material issues because they could fluctuate overnight. I mean, there could be a drought in the Midwest. There could be a war somewhere, God forbid. But, you know, and those are hard things to predict. But make sure you build in some risk mitigation on your raw material costs increasing. Manufacturing too hard to scale. Um, wow. You know, I talked about this yesterday. So processes that look great on a lab scale may not scale as well as you think because the little issues that don't show up at the lab scale really start looking ugly when you go to pilot and start scaling up to larger and larger volumes. And that's what really can be challenging because if, it, if you're not retaining your economics or your target cost of goods or your quality control, you're going to have a problem. And how is that going to impact your business? Also, large economies of scale. You know, what I found, again, going back to my bioamber days, is that we, when we ran our process economic simulations, we had like people just doing process economics all day long on crystal ball. It was like, I had reams and reams of notebooks. I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if I share that with you. But I had like a bookshelf filled of five, six books just to get me to, to knowing what it's going to cost me to make these chemicals for from sugar per pound. It's like, just give me the number. I needed to read five books of PID drawings and mass transfer balances and all this good stuff. And what I came to realize, it would cost $100 million to build a plant to make one pound of succinic acid cost competitively. Well, that got us into a chicken and egg scenario because we were trying to project finance on, with Wall Street bankers this breakthrough process and saying, well, we're going to make this stuff economically and we're going to have customers. And they say, well, that's not going to work for us. You need to have the customers sign up. And you need to have raw material contracts. And you need to have engineering and construction firms putting their balance sheets at risk to guarantee that this process will work. So stay away from large economies of scale technology. I, in this economy, I really would urge you guys to think about technology that had low economies of scale and also was modular. Because you don't want to build a plant that's underutilized. So if you have assets that are there that are, that are running at 50% utilization, that's not good for your cash flow. And it's really, it's, it's, it's some, you want to have something that could be modular. So as your customer needs more capacity and you know, they give you a purchase order, then you, you could build another line. And you can add more lines incrementally. So what I would suggest is in this economy, look for small economies of scale modular manufacturing if you're going to do that yourself. And quality. You know, what makes America great is we build high quality products. You know, I'm proud to be an American, so if I say that too many times, I'm, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I think if, you know, America is a great country and what we've built is products that are based on quality. When I see an American product and it's like tough, badass type product where you know it's not going to break down in five days or five months, that's really important because if you want to build a long-term sustainable relationship with your customer, if you have a product recall or what they thought they were getting doesn't materialize because the quality management within your company is flawed and you don't have good quality systems, that's a, that's, a, that's a problem waiting to implode on you because you will lose your customers very fast with poor quality. So really be on top of quality. So now that you've thought through all this garbly gook and all this stuff that I've just spewed out is, you know, I know this is so much information. So I, I'm just here to educate, you know, from my experience. I don't know hardly anything. I've just had a few experiences. but. I wanted to give you enough that if you can get a few sound bites and culminate this into a good, well-vetted business plan, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Because a lot of entrepreneurs don't spend the time to build their plan. So the first thing to think about is, do I have a strategic thesis that's defensible? What's my strategy? 
You know, I look at it in terms of chess and mathematics. That's how I think. Not to say it's right or wrong, but I, I lay out the chess board. I think, well, here's all my competitors, here's my customers. I look at patents so I can build a sort of a topology of where everyone's, where they are with their claims and where they're going and how I'm going to navigate. So you want to build your strategy on how you're going to get to market, acquire your customers in a, in a way where the assumptions are credible and your strategic thesis is defensible. Also know your competitive landscape. As I said a few minutes ago, your competitors aren't just going to roll over and give you market share. Oh yeah, take our customers, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. You can have those five and we'll keep these fives. These companies invest a lot of money to acquire these customers. As I've talked about customer acquisition, it's very arduous. So when they build their position, they're going to fight like heck to preserve it. So you better expect, and this is part of your chess game thinking, is that they are going to retaliate. And they may retaliate hard. You know, I can give you an example of a company named Jivo. I'm going to put their stock chart up in a moment. You know, I, Pat Gruber, who worked at Cargill, is the founder of the company. I knew Pat back in the day when I started BioAmber. Um, they started Jivo with the idea of making isobutanol from uh, sugar fermentation. And then DuPont claimed, hey, we have patents in, on bacteria that can make isobutanol, so we're going to sue you. So they retaliated. They didn't want them to build a plant. And it's crushed them. It really has, and I hope for their sake that they could, re they could recover. But the retaliation was swift, swift and decisive. And this company is near, near out of business. Because they got, they got a lot of cash still, but man, they, their stock price, and I'll show you their chart, has gone from like 30 bucks to like two bucks, or less than two bucks. And that patent dispute was a strategic initiative by their competitors to retaliate and crush this company. So just really think about how your competitors are going to respond. Again, be really conservative with your financial forecast. So when you build your business plan, don't assume 10% market share capture. Assume 1%, 2% over more time. And think, can I still be successful if I only capture 2% of the market? Is that, is that work? Because if you're conservative with that assumption and you still have a business, then you, know, you could surprise your investors to the upside. And maybe you'll surprise yourself in the process as well. So, Really think about being conservative with assumptions, especially what it's going to cost, how long it's going to take, and how long it's going to take to acquire your customers. Corporate development plan. I don't know if you guys you know, have, when you build your plans, think about corporate development the way I do, um, but I like to think of it in, in stages. Because when I go raise money, if I go, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going we're to take over the world, and we're going to do it all in a year, People don't understand what I'm saying because it seems so ambitious, and they don't understand what's driving the successes, what's going to get us there. So if you break your corporate development down into stages where you could say, okay, here's, here's some time, here's some headcount, here's some resources, and here are the key value driving milestones of this stage, then you've clearly articulated one stage of your plan very well so the investor could see, okay, if you hit these milestones and execute, I could see a step up in the valuation between round one and round two. And then you've, given, you've set the basis for good communication with your investors from quarter to quarter to say, here's how we've done against that plan. And they could really see it. And I'll, talk about, I'll give you a sample corporate development plan that I use in my presentations, not only internally, but externally to partners and prospective investors and existing investors. Organizational plan. You got, as I said before, is what kind of team are you going to build? What can you outsource? And the corporate development plan and that organizational plan need to work in concert. And we're going to talk about that. I'll show you a sample org chart and explain to you how I think about organizational development. Again, IP strategy and development, same thing, IP, IP, IP. But it's not only about filing some patents, but it's about having a strategy. Once you define your IP real estate, so think about it, it's a, it's a piece of ground you're going to buy to build your house. So this is a virtual and tangible asset, but the most important asset of your company. So how big is my real estate? Where are the borders? Because you don't want to get prior ordered by a technology that doesn't work. I mean, that would be really bad if you thought that the border shouldn't be narrowed in around that piece of IP and you included that in your, in your IP prosecution because that's going to really, that you may get prior ordered by something that you shouldn't have got a prior ordered on. So once you know what the real estate looks like and what the borders are, then you need a strategy to go capture all that real estate. And then lastly, when you build your plan, what are, investors are paying you with their hard-earned money, where you're taking a salary and you're building your business, they're paying you to execute. Your ability to execute, execute, execute is what they're really buying into. So you can ask Grady and other venture capitalists or angel investors, whoever's going to fund your company, what are you buying? You're buying management's ability to execute. 
So tech transfer partnerships. So let's break that down a little bit. I've licensed, as Grady said, I've licensed a lot of technology from government labs, academic labs. And this partnership is really, really important. So if you build that great plan, so we've already gone through the ideation part extensively. So talking briefly about tech transfers, if you're licensing technology from an institution, government lab, academic lab, sell the, them the plan. Sell them the plan. Because if their expectation is, oh, these guys are going to license technology to pay back my outstanding patent costs that we've incurred all this patent prosecution expense, we need someone to pay for that. Let's just get a licensee. That's, that's the wrong place from which to start a relationship. So if they understand your plan, they could also understand the challenges you're going to face. So if you need to adapt your model or the agreement needs to be flexible enough to adapt to the changes in your business, they already knew the plan. They're, you, treat them as one of your investors. They're one of your biggest customers is your, your licensing department or your tech transfer department at your institution that you're licensing your technology. So te you want to uh, basically um, make sure that they're on board with your plan so they can not only be flexible with amending licenses as your business changes, but they could also give you an agreement from the outset that's economically favorable for your business. A lot of IP institutions like to carve the fields of use back and say, well, you could have this one, but you can't have all these other ones. So you're, you're limiting my opportunity before we even get started. How do you know what I'm going to commercialize and not commercialize? Why don't you give me everything? Because I'm going to take the risk, raise the money, my own money, whatever the case may be, in my time to build a business around your technology, which is just sitting there. Why don't you give me the most favorable terms? And if I'm not diligent in the future, you could always carve it back later. But let's start out with something that I could take to my investors and I could sell them. Because most investors that are astute are going to say, show me the licensing agreement, because that's the contractual agreement that ties those assets to your company. And if that agreement is unfavorable, your investors that are smart are going to send you back there to renegotiate. And it's a bad reflection on you if you have a bad license agreement, because it shows you can't, you can't negotiate well. You didn't understand the mandate. So I would really make sure that you have good licensing terms with your IP institution. Oops. So collaboration between the startup and inventors, I mean, I could spend an hour just talking about that, but I won't bore you to tears. But you know, the collaboration with the inventor is everything. Because as I said before, if that inventor isn't ready to take on this responsibility of startup, because I work with someone now um, who's a first-time entrepreneur. He's a brilliant material scientist. He's South Korean. Uh, he's also an American citizen. Brilliant guy. He didn't know what was going to be happening. He's like, oh, yeah, I got some cool technology. Eric's going to take it from here. When we got in the throes, he's like, calls me up one day. He's like, dude, I'm exhausted. He didn't say, dude, I'm from California, so I say, dude. But he said whatever he said. But what he said in short was, this is super tiring. I can't keep up. So we hired him more people, and he's doing fine. But he started to understand, get his head around the idea that entrepreneurship is hard work. It's really difficult. So to get the, the academic inventor on board with this early is really, really important. Aligning interest with equity participation. So if you get your IP institution, the tech transfer office, and you get your inventor on board with building this company, you want to make sure that they're incentivized. Because I could tell you, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to work so hard and for a salary training my hours for dollars because I can go get a full-time job somewhere. What people are working for is equity. And that's just human nature. It's like I want to get paid for what I'm worth or what I think I'm worth. So if you align interest with equity, then when times get tough, you need to re renegotiate your license or you need to ask your inventor to work the weekend, they're going to go, yeah, and I own equity. So I'll do that. I, I get it. And also there's the unfortunate conflicts of interest that may exist in that relationship with an inventor also owning equity. So I've, so I've seen this solved in some of my uh, licensing agreements and research agreements with IP institutions by using a co-investigator. Um, you know, so by having co-PIs, that could solve that conflict of interest. But just something to be mindful of when you're building these kind of relationships. And then what's the timing of spinning out your company? So I'm a firm believer that you want to use that lab infrastructure that's there until you get to proof of concept to where you now have something that's valid that you could take out and raise more money and reduce the cost of capital to build the infrastructure to do R&D internally and outside the university. That's when you're really ready. So make sure you don't do that too early or too late, because if you do it too late, the academic inventor is going to get tired. You're going to wear them out, because they're, remember, they're, they're educating students at the same time while they're also helping you build the company. It's a little taxing. So you don't want to overburden them. So just make sure that the timing is about right. 
So let's uh, talk about the valley of death. How am I doing on time? I feel like I'm a little going to be a little over. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm going way too slow. Um, so valley of death is really the is the is that chasm between when you have a concept to when you have a proven product or proven service. And it and traditionally it's taken a lot of money for people to get from one side of that chasm to the other. And this is where a lot of companies fail and go out of business. So. You know, what we've seen is companies go out, they raise some angel money, and then they raise successive rounds of venture capital after venture capital after venture capital to get there. But unfortunately, they may never get there with venture financing, and they use the IPO market and proceeds from an IPO to fund their development, and they're not really fundamentally sound when they go public, and kind of here's what happens. So here's, these aren't, you know, um, black diamond ski runs in Colorado. These are actually the two-year stock charts of four clean tech companies. And what this basically shows you is these are four companies that went IPO way too early. The VC wanted to dress them up and make them look great for the ball, but they weren't fundamentally sound. And this is what's been killing clean tech as an industry, is having companies going out, as far as their IPOs, way too early and using public capital to fund early stage development. It just doesn't work. So, you know, I've talked a lot about this, and since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to whip through these things. So a shift in startup finance, I think this is actually a key point. This is probably one of the most important messages I can give you, is that venture capital is dying in this country, unfortunately. Um, there is some, still some VC finance, but it's very far and few between. A lot of VC funds have gone out of business. Um, a lot of them have portfolios that are upside down. Um, there's a lot less transactions happening. So they have played a vital role in capital formation, but unfortunately the approach to building these massive portfolios where they bet on 100 companies with the hope that 10 will really be successful to compensate for the 90 that maybe aren't so great or go out of business, hasn't worked. It's evident in the numbers. I mean, it's just not my opinion. It's objective quantitatively that the performance of venture funds has been dismal for the most part. So that's why this industry is not attracting much more capital. So what are you going to do? How are you going to build your company? So what I would suggest is looking elsewhere and thinking differently about how are you going to finance your company. And so, um, you know, for the sake of time, what I would really say is that look to sources that are typically less conventional or alternative, like the family office. The family office is basically rich families build an office that function like VCs where they have analysts and people that will source deals. Uh, negotiate transactions, consummate transactions on the behalf of your own personal wealth. And there's thousands of these offices around the United States. And there's databases that tell you who these people are. That's a great avenue for startup finance. Also, corporate VCs. A lot of big companies are starting venture capital arms to finance their way into early stage technology, giving them access to ideas that they normally wouldn't fund internally, potentially, but something they could later acquire a partner to get access as technology as it matures and hits milestones becomes credible. And also corporate deal making. There's, there's more cash on corporate balance sheets right now than ever before in history. It's unprecedented time to do deals with big companies. You know, when I started out in business, I get a lot of pushbacks from corporations that, wanted to, that I, you know, I wanted to think about doing a deal with because they would say, it's not invented here. Don't want to do a deal with you. We could do better. We don't need you. Well, that's changed because big companies realize, you know what, we can only do so much and the bigger we get, the less efficient we get and we need to fulfill the obligations to our shareholders to grow our business. So we'll take it wherever we can get it. So I've seen a big shift in that. So with cash on the balance sheet and a change in that mentality, that's a great source of money. So here's what I would say um, as far as how to cross the valley of death successfully, and I'll just stick these up here so we can just run through them quickly, is don't just validate a technology or product or service. Validate, I should say, don't validate just technology. Build a great product early. So how do you do that? You engage your customers very early on. If you've got something cool, say to them, and, I've, and I'm doing this right now with the technology I'm developing, I said, give me your specifications for your dream product. We'll spend our money and our time developing it, and if we do it, you could buy it, or you can give us some sort of contractual commitment to buy it and or to finance our manufacturing. So what's your risk? They say, nothing. I'll do that. That's a no-brainer. So they, you get their specifications early, and you build them their dream product, and you report to them along the way. And if you hit your milestones in developing their product that they want, then you've got a built-in customer or a partner, and you've got another source of money. 
So do this early, because this could save you a year to two years on your development timeline just by doing this, and this is everything. Because it's not about what you think is valid. It's about what your customer and partners think are valid. Also, um, keep your burn rate really, really low. Because a lot of us like to, you know, to, to have nice offices and this and that, but it's not, it's not relevant. You know, just have a you know, couple of boxes and a, and a, and a door on, you know, and, and, a, and a stool from your house and a, and a computer is all you need a phone. That's it. You don't need lavish offices. Get that later. Once you are profitable, then you can really scale your expenses. But I would, I'd really suggest managing your burn rate is really important. And when it comes to organization, build from the bottom up. VCs have typically wanted all these big resumes on board. So again, it's, the company's dressed for an IPO. It looks great. On paper, it's fantastic. You got all these guys from big corporations with big resumes as your management team. But those guys are waiting around for a business to build. They're not guys that'll roll up their sleeves and do the work. They're not going to be those people. So what do you need? A lot of chiefs. You need a lot of Indians. So hire from the bottom up. Hire direct, director level people. Hire people that'll work in a lab. Generate the data. The data is what's going to drive your business, not a bunch of great resumes. So this, in quick, this is my corporate development um, plan. That I borrowed this from Starbucks because I was in Starbucks one day. And they had this like, cool visual about their roast program and how they were developing these new roast programs to deliver new coffees to Starbucks near you. So I took a picture with my iPhone. I said, I love the way they showed the staged approach to building something. So I adapted this to my own corporate development plan. And it really is cool because you could see the progression. You could see the stages. And you can understand these are the key milestones against that timeline that I need to achieve to drive the value of my business. So again, staging your plan is so helpful for raising money, for communicating and managing uh, your internal team. So I, I think it's really, really important to have a plan that's staged. And again, building from the bottom up. Like in my, again, these are stages. And they, as I said from the outset, you want your organization plan and your corporate development plan to be in lockstep. And here you could see stage one, all I had was, I had a, in my case, I hired an in-house patent attorney because I had a unique opportunity to build a big, valuable piece of IP real estate. So I knew I'd get more value by having someone house. But it's just me and him, one other guy on the board, and our team at an academic lab. That's it. That's all we needed. Build technology, generate data, file patents. That's all you need to do. Forget about all the other headcount. It's not necessary. Then when we go to stage two, when we have a proven tech product, then we hire director level people to work in the lab to manage other technicians. And again, just generate data, scale up technology, validate product. You don't need to be building all these, an organization with a bunch of C-level and VP-level people before you're really building a lot of revenue. It's a waste of money. I know it sounds good. You can get that experience from advisors that you can give them stock to sit on your board or your advisory board, whatever it may be. You can get people that have a lot of experience. If they like your opportunity, they want to be involved for equity. So here's an IP strategy that one of many that I've, I've worked to, with my team in building. This is a material science company that, that came up with a strategy that was kind of a, an architecture that had vertical top-down multiple layers. And, and as you could see, that we had five buckets that were designed, as I said, to have multiple layers of IP with each layer having multiple patents. So we had a really novel manufacturing process. We filed patents on that, de device claims, process claims. We also had unique compositions of materials. We wanted to patent all those. We had ways of optimizing and tuning those materials down to one nanometer, so we wanted to patent all of those optimizations. Then we had commercial applications of those materials. We wanted to patent the applications. And then once we went into development, we optimized these materials for those applications. So if someone wanted to breach this fortress, they're going to have to breach all these layers and all these patents within each layer. So what you could see here is there's a strategy that has to be adopted and executed on to protect your asset base, which is your intellectual property if you're developing technology. So lastly, and I know I'm a few minutes over, but this is really important for you guys to consider as you know, entrepreneurs, is what's around you in your community that's going to help you execute and build your business? And when we've seen in the formation of clusters like Silicon Valley. Why is Silicon Valley so, so successful? Because they focused in, in, on one single industry initially, which was the internet. You know, before that they had, OK, before that, OK, I got it, Sean, I got it. You're great, goodbye. So anyways, God, it's pestering me. 
So this is for your benefit. I've, I know this stuff already, but, and you may all know it too. So what I, I say to IP institutions that are in and around this area, develop ingress, investment grade science. Don't just patent ideas that don't have any commercial application. Invest, and tell, invest in ideas that can be commercialized by entrepreneurs like you guys, but also in the areas or the industries that are strategic to the East Tennessee area. Because if it's outside of that, who's going to care? So if you guys are focused on digital media or energy storage or whatever your industries are of strategic importance to East Tennessee, the IP institution should be solving those problems and giving you investment great science. So as part of this cluster dynamic, if you look at the Bay Area in San Francisco and why Silicon Valley works, is the, the IP institutions all, are all about that. They know what to develop because they're trying to help stimulate economic development. And it's also having seed funding, because if you're not going to be raising venture capital in this region, and it's very difficult, I realize, then you need to have more seed investors, but with also with deep domain expertise. If they don't really understand the industry you're getting into, then clearly they're not going to be all that helpful, especially down the road when there's challenges. So I think, you know, I have to wrap it up, but I would say that, you know, um, having this kind of a cluster dynamic and understanding how this needs to be set up, where policymakers could be very actively involved in helping this community build into, some, into a cluster, that's really going to be important to support you guys in being successful. So I wanted to thank you for your time and really appreciate the, the, the year. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. We, we appreciate you being here.